This video is an introduction to XPS. XPS is most often viewed through the analysis of XPS data, which involves using software to work out quantification and chemical state information based on spectra that are gathered from samples. But to properly understand how the sample is analyzed in terms of the software, it's important to have some appreciation of the XPS technique itself. So this involves having an understanding of what we're looking at in terms of energy spectra and also how spectra are acquired that will then be processed to produce the information that we're after. An XPS spectrum is an energy spectrum and the energy spectrum is acquired by changing the energy at which we sample the number of electrons that arrive at a detector. And as a consequence of these types of measurements, we can create a histogram of intensity as a function of energy. Here it's plotted as intensity as a function of binding energy. And the binding energy is related to an electronic configuration within an atom. And if electrons leave the surface without any additional interaction with the sample, then we end up with peaks. But if the electrons are scattered en route to the vacuum, which is the zone from which electrons can be measured without significant energy loss, then what we see is signal that would originally come from peaks, but now appear at energies different from these peaks. And this is the origin of these background intensities we see here. So the energy spectrum that we're going to analyze in the software involves understanding both the background shapes and also shapes that are associated with these photoemission peaks. When one first sees an XPS spectrum, the first question that you think of is what is the physical basis for these peaks that we see on top of a background? So the first thing that I'll look at is the physical basis for XPS. Then why perform XPS on a sample? What are the strengths of XPS that make it the technique of choice for a given type of sample? Then one should ask, are all samples appropriate for XPS? That's a reasonable question. And what type of information can we determine about a sample via XPS? These are related, of course. And then finally, what do I need to know before I can make best use of XPS? And all of these questions are somewhat fundamental and basic, but nevertheless, to someone new to XPS, these are the types of questions that you need to have answers to. The physical basis for peaks within an XPS spectrum are that electrons are emitted from an atom with a characteristic energy. And what we have is a photon scatters a core level electron within an atom and even within solid state the inner core electrons are well defined in terms of energy and when the scattering process is finished we're left with an iron with a hole where the electron used to be and an ejected electron with a, a characteristic kinetic energy that depends on the difference in energy between the initial state and the final state and also involves the energy of the photon. If we can identify the energy of electrons that arrive at a detector, then we can determine from which atom and which electronic state within the atom that electron originated. In which case, we can quantify the sample. Because of quantum physics, we can relate the number of scattering events to the number of electrons that are recorded at a specific energy that tells us the electron came from a particular atom. So we're able to quantify a sample in terms of the intensity of the electrons of a given energy. We classify elements and chemical state in terms of binding energy. And this means that the electron that is emitted has a kinetic energy which we want to relate back to a physical property of the atom. So we talk about the binding energy of a lithium 1s electron. And this is the difference between the final energy of the ion and the initial energy of the atom. However, the kinetic energy is the difference between the energy of the photon and the binding energy. 
So you might expect that we can directly relate the kinetic energy of this electron to the binding energy. But unfortunately this is not the case because we have to detect this electron. So the electron, after it's emitted from an atom, has to then pass through the sample and then round the analyzer and then be detected. So there is another potential loss of energy as a result of fields within this system. So the work function is one way of describing it, is an energy that is systematically lost in the process of transferring an electron between the sample and the detector. In addition to this instrumental factor, the sample itself may be charged positively or negatively. So there are retarding or accelerating fields that act on these electrons. So these two cause an offset in the kinetic energy that we actually record. So this means that we must calibrate in some way an instrument in terms of its work function and then we may also need to calibrate in terms of what the sample is contributing to the energy of the electron. So the binding energy that we actually record is not an absolute value, it is a relative value. It should be treated as so when we interpret peaks and chemical state in terms of binding energy. In practice we don't see a single energy for lithium on S. What we see is a distribution of intensities over a range of energies. And this is for a number of reasons. The X-rays that excite the electrons are generated by bombarding, in this case, an aluminium anode with electrons of sufficient energy to create these X-rays. But they don't just create one energy. They create a range of energies and when we use a dual anode, we're relying on the resonance of a particular X-ray line within the X-ray spectrum of aluminium. But this means that the distribution of energies of that X-ray line would manifest as part of the shape that we see in the photoelectron line. So we introduce the monochromator in the form of a quartz crystal, which uses a diffraction pattern to single out a narrow distribution of energies that then arrive as photons on the sample and produce these photoelectrons. So the shape that we see in a photoelectron peak is related to the shape of the distribution of the photon energies and it's also related to how the analyzer moves electrons from the sample through to the entrance of the hemispherical analyzer and on to the detectors. So the shape that we see in this lithium 1s peak is related to instrumental factors as well as the physics of the photoelectric effect. And the physics of the photoelectric effect has a strong bearing on these peaks because you can see from the same instrument and similar energies you produce a wide range of widths and distributions for these photoelectron peaks. And that's because there is an uncertainty in the energy of electrons in the ground state. But more importantly, there is a, a greater uncertainty in the energy of the electrons in the final state. And so we see predominantly the distribution of the final state in the photoemission peaks. Up to this point, I've been describing photoelectron peaks that are a consequence of a photon scattering an electron. So this is an example, sodium 1s, is another example, chlorine 2s, chlorine 2p. These are all peaks that exist because photons have scattered an electron and the electron has been ejected at the time of the ionization. There are, however, other peaks within XPS data. And this is a sodium KLL line. And in fact, this is related to the photoemission, but it is referred to as an OJ line. That is to say, this is an XPS-induced OJ emission line within an XPS spectrum. The existence of OJ lines in an XPS spectrum is an indirect consequence of the photoionization process. In fact, the existence of these OJ lines relies on the final product of a photoionization event, where we have an excited state with a hole in the K shell. So the photon enters the electronic system 
interacts with the K-shell, shell, creates a new entity, which is the iron, and the photoemission peak is evidence that this process is occurring when we perform XPS. And this is a necessary condition for the start of the Auger process. The Auger process involves a capture of an electron by the K shell. And this is taken from the L shell. And when the L shell drops an electron into the K shell, there's an excess energy. And this could be taken away as a photon, or in the case of the Auger process, the energy that is liberated by this movement of the electrons is transferred out of the ion in the form of an Auger electron. So we either have fluorescence in the case of the generation of X-rays or the creation of a doubly excited ion with the emission of an electron with a characteristic energy that is the difference between the energy of the initial singly excited state and the doubly excited state that is the result of this Auger process. The fact that an Auger line relies on the difference between an ion and a doubly excited ion means that the energy that is liberated by the Auger process is always the same, irrespective of the photon energy that was used initially to create the singly excited ion. This means that the kinetic energy for Auger lines are always the same. The kinetic energy for photoelectron lines that involve scattering of an electron by a photon will change depending on the energy of the photon. So if we change the photon energy, we can move in kinetic energy the photoelectron lines relative to the Auger lines. And this can sometimes be very useful in XPS. The explanation for these Auger lines has been described in terms of an atom with a low mass and also using an s orbital. And the reason the sodium 1s was chosen for this explanation is that this is one of the simplest forms of the photoemission process, low atomic weight and an s orbital, and the symmetry of the electronic configuration makes it possible to see a single peak for the photoemission process. This is not always the case. The reason a sodium 1s was used in the explanation of the Auger process is because the atom and the ion, when a K shell electron is involved in the photoionization process, both produce one energy level. At least for low mass elements, there is a single peak, which is what we saw with the sodium. However, if the angular momentum of the electron that is emitted is non-zero, this means in the ion there are unpaired electrons that have angular momentum and there's coupling between the spin and the orbital angular momentum that splits the energy levels depending on which of the p orbitals are involved in the photoionization. So this split in energy, depending on whether it's a, a 2p one half or a 2p three halves, is the explanation of why we see doublet peaks in XPS and it's why we need to label peaks with three quantum numbers to differentiate the different energy levels that are possible within the ions. The next question to consider is why perform XPS on a sample? And the reason that we would want to perform XPS on a sample is that XPS is a surface sensitive technique. And the reason that it is surface sensitive is that when a photon enters the sample it may penetrate to many microns into the sample and create electrons from atoms many microns within the sample but only electrons that are sufficiently close to the surface that the electrons can travel through the sample without losing any energy will the electron contribute to the photoemission peak. So this means that the electrons that we collect are only from the surface outer region of the sample. In fact for an aluminium K-alpha X-ray source, we expect a maximum of about 10 to 12 nanometers of material to contribute to a photoemission peak. All other electrons that we see from that photoemission peak appear within the background signal and we do not use that as part of the quantification. So the photoemission peak is targeting the outermost layers of a material. 
What type of samples are appropriate for XPS? This is an example of a sample that is appropriate for XPS. It's exploiting the strength of XPS in the sense that we have a material that is a metal with an oxide film and the oxide film is thin enough that signal can come from the metal and the oxide and we can see that XPS is able to separate both the oxide signal and the metal signal in terms of offsets in energy and therefore we can use this information to calculate things such as the thickness of this oxide film on a metal sample. So XPS is a powerful technique for looking at the outermost part of a sample. Although this sample may contain oxide at the top and the bottom of the foil, because of the sampling depth we know that we're only looking at this top part of the sample. None of the aluminium oxide here appears as a photoelectron peak within the data simply because this is more than 10 nanometers below the surface that is being analyzed. So XPS is capable of focusing on interfaces and then working out the chemical state for material in those interfaces. Because XPS is a surface sensitive technique, the sample must be clean. If we expose a sample to air, there will be some form of adventitious contamination and if it's sufficiently thick, it may interfere with our analysis of the material of interest. So maintaining the cleanliness of a sample is an important part of performing XPS. The other aspect of XPS is that we are modifying the electronic structure of atoms within the material. And so chemistry may be performed as we perform XPS. And we should be aware of this. Samples may degrade under the influence of the X-rays. So what we start with may not be what we finish with. Once we've selected an appropriate sample, the next question is what type of information can we determine about a sample by XPS? And arguably one of the most widely used applications of XPS must be polymer chemistry. And this provides a nice example of what information is available about a sample through analysis by XPS. These data are related to this polymer and by working out the position of these peaks we can see different chemical state for carbon within the polymer. So each one of these peaks here are offset and they're offset with a characteristic energy that tells us we've got carbon bonded to carbon and hydrogen or we've got carbon bonded to oxygen or we've got carbon bonded to oxygen and double bonded to oxygen and each one of these colors that we see here in the polymer relate to these colors in the spectrum and they are telling us chemical state information based on peak energy. To a lesser extent the forward half maximum peaks provides us some kind of information about the chemical state. For example in the aluminium we saw that the oxide and the metal were different peak widths so the width can have some bearing on the type of material we're looking at. In this case, this is carbon. We could see a width of about 1 eV, slightly more. The, the actual width it may be related to the resolution of the data, but if we had sufficient resolution, we might see there's a difference between, say, a graphitic carbon peak and a carbon peak that derives from a polymer. So there is some evidence within the full width half maximum. But the more important evidence derives from the binding energy and it also derives from the peak intensity. So here we have three peaks and they're all of similar intensities as measured by area. This would be measured in counts per second EV and when we compare peaks by counts per second EV we can see that these three peaks are all about the same intensity. So this is suggesting that we have an an equal number of carbon atoms within this polymer that all have these chemical states. So we're providing information about proportions of chemical states and the separation of chemical state through binding energy. The previous example was a case where bell-shaped curves could be fitted to data and then information gathered about 
the different chemical states based on these components that are part of a peak model. There are, however, other situations where when we measure an element such as cerium in different oxidation states, we don't see spectra that lend themselves to being fit by individual bell-shaped curves. However, XPS shows a clear difference between cerium 3 plus and cerium 4 plus oxide. So it's entirely feasible that the analysis of a material that contains cerium 3 plus and 4 plus oxide can be performed by fitting an ensemble of effectively bell-shaped curves that we don't need to identify the individual bell-shaped curves to calculate the relative proportions of the cerium 3 plus and the cerium 4 plus in an unknown material. So XPS provides us with chemical state information in terms of shapes that we see within the data that are complex but are clearly evidence of different chemical state. In addition to peak models, there's further information that can be gathered from XPS data when we look at survey data, which include peaks and background. And the point from these two examples that we see here is that we can spot within the survey measurement by looking at the relationship between photoemission peaks and the background signal, for example, this oxygen peak here and the oxygen peak we see here. Both are measured from silicon dioxide the difference between these two is that we have a background that raises up and a lower intensity oxygen peak relative to a carbon peak because we have an overlayer of PP hex, so a plasma polymerized hexane overlayer that contains no oxygen, just carbon and hydrogen on top of silicon dioxide. And we can see this within the shapes of the background. We can also see this within the quantification of the silicon and the oxygen. That the ratio of silicon and oxygen is measured from silicon 2p at a binding energy of about 100 and oxygen at a binding energy of about 530 eV. When we have an overlayer we end up with not just a change in the background but the ratio of these peaks also changes because of different attenuation of the silicon compared to the oxygen. So changes in the quantification from the expected quantification for a given material such as silicon dioxide which should have two oxygen for one silicon indicate that the material that we're looking at is not homogeneous and has some kind of overlay that is interfering with the silicon dioxide measurement. This could be seen as either an interference or it could be valuable information about the material that we're analyzing. So XPS contains not just chemical state information, there is information about the in-depth distribution of materials within the sample. Once we've prepared a sample, what do we need to do to effectively measure a spectrum from the sample using an XPS instrument? Well, the first step is mounting the sample correctly. So placing the sample in the instrument with appropriate mountings for the charge neutralization or for a conducting sample is an important part of preparing a measurement. And then when we do the measurement, we need to choose the appropriate operating mode for the type of sample we're analyzing. The operating mode involves selecting lens systems, pass energies, charge neutralization, x-ray power, various other aspects of the instrument that will allow an effective measurement to be performed. So there's no point measuring a high energy resolution spectrum from a material that has very broad peaks. And similarly measuring a spectrum that has narrow peaks with a high pass energy, low energy resolution mode, would mask information that would be important to understanding the sample. So choosing the right operating mode is an important part of any XPS experiment. And then once we've measured the data, we ought to have the ability to spot when the data were compromised in some way and there are artifacts that are not due to the sample but are due to the measurement itself. We often see spectra published 
in papers that show very nice spectral shapes but they tend not to show spectra where there are problems and then once we've got the data that is good we need to know how to prepare that data analysis of the data so that we can produce scientifically meaningful results from the XPS experiment. The analysis of XPS data necessarily requires software and a good command of the processing steps, the analysis steps, the curve fitting and all the other aspects of XPS that is embodied in software is an important part of analyzing and getting good scientific results out of the XPS data.